panelists to um, just give a brief, like one to two minute, um, just a short description of, of who you are and like the organization or the, the business that you're that you're coming from, and and then we're gonna have a series of three questions, and we'd like the responses to be about like two to three minutes long, uh, if that's possible. Well, yeah, and um, Genevieve here in the front will give you like a. I'll hand up when you've gone two minutes. And then say like one minute left. If there's one minute remaining, I'll be here watching you. And after that, we'll hurry you up. And then, um, I guess just for the sake so everyone can hear you, we'll just uh, pass around this mic. When you're giving your responses, turn it, there's a little switch to turn it on. You don't have to use it, but if you're soft spoken, that'd be great. All right, so I guess, Dan, would you like to start? Sure. Introductions. Um, if I'm not loud enough, let me know. Um, my name is Dan Florlich. I'm a local teacher. Um, I work at the Layman Alternative Community School. It's a public uh, alternative school that's uh, here in Ithaca. And uh, I guess the reason that I'm sitting up here is that I've sort of wended my way into working the land with uh, students of mine. And I'm part of a, what we call the Youth Farm, which started two years ago. Yes, last year was its second year, and um, about three and a half to four acres of organic vegetables that's run, uh, designed, run, planned, uh, completely by youth, essentially. A little, little farm manager help. But. <coughs> Small Farms Program. We serve and support small farms across New York State, and our biggest cornerstone project right now is the Northeast Beginning Farmer Project, um, which we've, uh, we're two years into now. And um, that project's mission is to arm new and aspiring farmers with all the resources they need to have successful farm startups. Hi, I'm Devin Van Noble. I work for the Groundswell, Groundswell Center for Local Food and Farming. Our mission is to provide diverse learners with um, the knowledge, skills, and access to resources necessary to create a sustainable local food system. Um, and our current three programs are the Summer Practicum, um, and the New Farmer Training Program, and the Co uh, Collaborative Regional Alliance for Farmer Training, which is called the CRAP Program. And uh, my job is to currently coordinate planning and development of the next project, which is our Farm Enterprise Incubator, uh, which will be at Eco Village. And so I'm in the process of doing that. That's fine. My name is Garrett. I run the Good Life Farm on Interlake in New York with my partner, Melissa. Um, it's a really pretty new farm, started in 2008. Um, we do a lot of different things out there, I guess. We have a, it's a pretty diversified farm. We have um, Livestock, we have a lot of grass uh, for you know, pasture, and uh, we have quite a few perennial, um, woody perennials. We have, we have orchards and acres of asparagus, and uh, I don't even know what else, but we, we're in that early startup phase where we're, um, we're putting a lot into it, trying to, trying to get things up and off the ground, a lot of building buildings and uh, putting up fences and spending money and working really hard and waiting for returns. Um, <laughs>
self-renewing systems that are based on perennials and grass, as Karen said, grass is a really big part of our farm. Thank you. First question, um, just get, like to get your general reactions of the film and uh, get some insight on what from your experience is perhaps the single largest barrier to aspiring or beginning farmers that, that you've come across in your, in your work. Should we each take a turn? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, so sure. um, I cried twice just because it was wonderful. <laughs> um, and, and it was wonderful in a way that wasn't just, you know, good people with media building images and voiceover and the kind of music that lets you just sort of go, yeah, isn't it just great? That, you know, that there were, there were facets of the film that were hard to look at and ones that were inspiring. Um, it came back to the fact that it's really hard work, um, which is something that I think the three of us have discovered together and learned to, to really enjoy. Um, so I love the film. Just briefly, perhaps one of the things that's a barrier from the standpoint of an educator is that I think while there, there are a lot of examples of hardworking, brilliant, visionary young people making a change, for the majority of folks, let's say at the high school level, I don't think it's on their radar quite yet. Um, I think the idea of the, the importance of localization of food for community, for health, for environmental health, for all of those reasons, it's not taught in most, most high schools, in any coursework. Um, and so I think one of the biggest barriers is just awareness. It's, it's burgeoning, but you know, that, that maybe, maybe that could be more present in public education in some ways. Um, I really enjoyed the film. It was a really nice glimpse, and I like that it was really sort of little short snippets of a lot of different farming, and it was nice to see more than what I'm involved in see different kinds of farming and different kinds of local food, I guess. And I guess from my own personal standpoint, the biggest barrier is kind of, I guess, the learning curve and the fact that I grew up having no part in farming at all and I kind of just got into it, you know, here and there. And now if that's actually something I want to do, the amount of knowledge that I would need to know to actually successfully do that is huge. So. Um, I liked the film because it was um, hopeful just to see um, the different the different people in like somewhat unexpected areas um, doing doing these sustainable practices and different all kinds of different trying out. Um, just because it's like, you get kind of, I see that every day here in Ithaca, so it's nice to see it somewhere else and see that like there is actually a possibility that it'll eventually spread. Um, and yeah, uh, the barrier I guess would be sort of what Noah was saying, just um, having, and Dan, just having that somehow integrated more into younger people's lives, um, just to start it off, you know, just to get them interested in the ideas young, and then because um, not many people know about it and what's going on, so it's nice to teach people about it early. Um, my reaction to the film was it came together beautifully. I um, I have to say I've been telling a few people this story, but. Um, this girl, a couple years ago, this girl named Severin, with three last names I've never been able to pronounce, contacted me and sent me uh, very whimsical emails. Um, she, she's a very creative person, takes a lot of poetic license, and I had no idea why she was coming to my office or what she was filming. She just showed up with a video camera and started asking me questions, and um, I had no idea that this movie was going to come together as beautifully as it did. I assumed everyone she interviewed had the same experience, but it, it appears not. Um, which was really reassuring <laughs> to me. And um, in terms of the barriers, I think it really depends on who you ask, as we've seen in the movie. Um, I, I see there's two groups of new and aspiring farmers. One is a group that tends to be involved with Future Farmers of America and Farm Bureau, and um, those young people tend to have access to land and infrastructure because they are um, being raised on
on farms and following in the traditions of their parents. However, for those people, their barriers tend to be social opportunities. Um, we saw the fellow from the South who said he worked a lot. Um, they don't have any young mentors to give them guidance or input. And furthermore, they just don't have any social networks. And then there's this other group of farmers, which we also saw in the video, who tend to be people going to liberal arts colleges and majoring in environmental studies. Food systems are reclaiming our democracy, their political acts, that, that, that kind of group. And for those people, they're really at a total loss with affording land and infrastructure. So I think those are the barriers that that group is facing. guess nice not only the breadth of um, experiences that it touches on but <coughs> also nice um, how it highlights yeah the success stories I didn't know what I was talking about just that it, it makes it it brings it back to reality in a way I think that um, re is really important for anybody thinking about these things and you know pondering the possibilities um, that there is um, I don't know there are people doing it out there and that um, it is possible to make it happen and I guess seeing those models is really um, important for getting the in inspiration to bring it to fruition, I guess. Um, and I guess the biggest barriers that I can think of is very similar to the ones people have been talking about, and I, I didn't think that was going to be the case, but um, I guess I would describe it as disconnection from the land and disconnection from resources, and so those in themselves are all the problems we talk about, you know, disconnection from financing opportunities or access to land, but then I think within those, those dis that disconnection that we've seen um, has been a disenfranchisement, a disempowerment, um, and a lack of confidence that um, I think we've all alluded to, which is people who haven't done this in the past are you know, traditionally nervous about jumping into it or don't have the, the knowledge that makes them feel confident enough to do it, and I think that whole confidence building element is like just uh, one of the key barriers to address in, in making it come. Uh, I thought the I thought the film had uh, a lot of energy and a lot of good uplift. I was kind of thinking when I was watching it that uh, it'd be great to have inside by my bed at night and I could like, come inside in the summer at like 10 o'clock and didn't get half as much stuff done as I thought I did and something maybe break or blew away or something. I could pop that in and feel good about things again. <laughs> Um, the, probably I would, echo, I would echo a lot of what folks are saying about uh, some of the big barriers. I think it's largely a, a cultural gap and tradition. Uh, I think it's uh, more than more than agricultural being a, a business uh, or a land stewardship. It's kind of it's like the, it's the, the cultural journey that we're on. It's the cultural process that human beings who live in civilizations engage in and uh, the traditions are passing on on how to, how to do those things is kind of broken. I'd, I'd say probably nine, nine out of ten folks in that video and, and most farmers that I meet didn't grow up farming and, and have um, are, are really at a disadvantage compared to people who have, who have learned it from their parents or grew up in that environment with, with their um, understanding of their, you know, basic understanding of their local ecology and a basic understanding of working with their hands, and, uh, just that, and that, that level of, of <coughs> confidence in, in what they're doing is makes sense and is right. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the tradition, I guess. Uh, I also like the movie, but I always have this urge to stand up for the things that I think need to be said. <laughs> and the two issues I took with the movie were the emphasis on young farmers being the ones who are thinking sustainably, and organically and I was blown away by that because we our generation of farmers is totally inheriting like 30 years of really hard work <laughs> struggling against um, the machine I guess so I feel like that is a disservice to you know the organic movement in general and I just kind of want to put that out there because um, I happen to be mentored by a lot of older people who are constantly furthering my ability to do what I'm trying to do and I just think that it's not just young farmers and we don't we don't want to end up in those boxes like 
the young farmers are going to save the rest of us from ourselves because I think that's a dangerous place for young farmers to go, ego-wise. We need to be very, very careful with our egos, us young people, <laughs> um, and not let them balloon out and squash everybody around us. Um, the other thing is that our farm and most of the farms that I know about that are startup farms in the past five years are funded by the Farm Service Agency. So I 100% do not agree with what they said about the Farm Service Agency, and I don't agree with it about a lot of the USDA um, chapters. I think what the, I would have said differently if I was them is that there's a a disparity of education from county to county in a lot of those governmental organizations. And we are in Seneca County, which is a very, it's like the grain belt of the Finger Lakes. Um, really, really beautiful ag soils. So really successful, large uh, grain farms. Um, and that's how the NRCS, Nas uh, Nas National? Yeah. Natural yeah. Resources yeah. Conservation yeah. Service uh, the Farm Service Agency, that's how all those guys think. But when we went to the Farm Service Agency, they were like, we've never seen a farm like yours. We totally don't understand it. And we want to take the risk. And they were like psyched. And they, since we got our loans from them, we have been called for so many testimonials and so been on so many case studies. <laughs> I just want to like dispel that myth. I think that was a total disservice to the people who are trying to um, serve it, but I think that there's a point that they're making, which is a lot of young farmers aren't trying to access those resources because you have to you have to be the educator a lot of times as well as the applicant, and that's a really challenging situation to be in. I've been struggling with it with our NRCS office in particular, where um, they do not have the resources to um, what's it called? complete like this whole transition to organic program that they have a mandate to do and they have money but they don't have the resources to actually help people through it and I'm educating my my agent who's actually evaluating my farm and it's very confusing and it's an enormous amount of work and I think it's incumbent upon us to do that work instead of saying they're not there for us I just I challenge that I would say. Uh, and Garrett already said what I think the big barriers are, except for what I just said. I think it is a barrier to be articulate enough, be organized enough, have the right data to actually give, make that education work with those governmental agencies especially, and be able to sort through all the bureaucratic stuff. Having the time and having the resources. When we started our farm, we were, we were totally off grid, but we we're living in a yurt, and the only electricity or internet or anything that we had was at work, which we're at work. So, like, just for me to answer emails and like do all the bureaucratic stuff to work with these was like a crazy challenge. And those are kind of like silly challenges, but just getting your crap together enough to like farm and to try to participate in this larger movement, I think that's a huge barrier actually in your first five years. I'm gonna stop. <laughs> Next question has to do sort of with Cornell and its land grant charge. Um, the land grant mission statement of Cornell charges them to, among other things, advance a productive and sustainable agriculture, support economic vitality, and facilitate individual and community health and well-being through the Cornell Cooperative Extension Service. That service is in turn committed to enable people to improve their lives and communicate their, through partnerships that put and communities, excuse me, to enab enable people to improve their lives and, and communities through partnerships that put experience and research knowledge to work. So I would like to ask all of you, in what ways is Cornell advancing opportunities and feasibility for beginning farmers, not just young farmers, but beginning farmers? Can you identify one or two areas of teaching, research, or outreach that is currently missing? So it's sort of a two-part question. What, what are they doing? In what way are they advancing opportunities for beginning farmers? And maybe can you identify specifically one or two areas that are missing? Could I, could I offer that maybe Violet takes this first and then goes on? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is an easy question for me. Um, I mentioned that our cornerstone project at the Small Farms Program is our Northeast Beginning Farmer Project. 
Um, we, most of our resources are on what we call our online resource center, which is nebeginningfarmers.org. Um, the last two years we've had the fortune of populating that with all sorts of fantastic resources to help new farmers. Um, we have an online video library which features some really graphic and up-close videos of production techniques, so, so new farmers can um, go online and learn how to castrate piglets right from, right from their own living room. Um, we, have a, we have a new farmer hub, which is chock full of resources, tutorials you can take, worksheets you can fill out, which help you to organize your thoughts and kind of line up your um, marketing plan and your production methods to sort of lead you to designing your own business plan. Um, again, from your living room. One of the, one of the things that we're learning right now is that a lot of new and aspiring farmers are, are in the dreamer phase. And so it seems ironic to say offer online classes to beginning farmers, which is something else we do. We actually offer about 20 different online courses to learn how to farm. Um, but, but the truth is a lot of people are working full time or even half time at computer jobs right now. And so they're sitting at their desk or they're sitting at home. They don't have access to land yet. And so, um, so that's why we do offer so many online and computer resources. And, um, in addition to that, we have a service provider map because it can be confusing to navigate the web of the many organizations that do serve beginning farmers. There's so many from the USDA programs like Soil and Water Conservation Districts to our program, nonprofits based at universities that are serving small farmers to um, just all the other cooperative extension resources out there. So we have a service provider map that um, allows new farmers to go and pinpoint exactly what service each organization provides. That's kind of an overview of some of our resources. Um, in terms of what we need to do better, there's all kinds of things. Um, first, we need to start serving minority farmers, veterans. Um, there's all kinds of underserved um, folks out there that would like to start farming, including urban farmers. We saw a few in the video, but there's so many vacant lots in cities that people would like to start farming. So we need to do a much better job of speaking to those audiences and making sure that we are articulating our resources so that, um, so that those folks can relate to what we're offering. Um, we need to do a much better job of getting people out on land, and that is a whole issue. It involves connecting organizations that do land linking, um, such as New York Farm Link, and it probably involves all sorts of, um, spearheading all sorts of programs like land banks and land cooperatives and um, land preservation programs that um, somehow get people out on land. We also need to do a much better job of serving and supporting all of those emerging organizations that are now um, helping new farmers. They're not necessarily talking to each other, and so people don't know necessarily what one nonprofit that's serving new farmers is doing. Um, there may be some opportunities for collaboration there. And then finally, we need to do a much better job of evaluating what this whole explosion of services to beginning farmers is doing, if what's effective and what's not. Are people actually benefiting from online courses or the tutorials we're offering? So um, we need to start, now that we're, um, now that there's so many people serving new farmers and so much interest, we really need to start um, evaluating what's effective and what's not so we can figure out where next to put our funding. Anyone else like to put something in from their own perspective? I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be about what Cornell is doing, but Cornell is supposed to be providing the service to, to um, our agricultural base, and all of us are part of that system in some way. I guess I, I don't mind taking it. Um, I guess I would just tack on maybe two additional services that Cornell does currently provide that um, do help farmers. Uh, there's FarmNet, and I'm not sure the degree, somebody might be able to correct me, but um, my understanding is that they provide business support services of different sorts for um, farmers, and uh, they provide advice and some direct kind of consulting, so there's a bit of like hands-on touch there for business support for new farmers. Um, there's also um, Imprint, or no, it's uh, Big Red Micro Capital, I'm sorry, um, and they work through the um, business school to provide small loans to area businesses, and they've been recently trying to do some focus on food ventures and ag ventures, I think, and uh, haven't necessarily made a lot of connections, but they're out there trying, and so there's that. <coughs> and then I guess in terms of the things that Cornell maybe is not necessarily doing in this area right now is, um, I don't know, I guess it, it, 
be interested to hear what you have to say, Violet. But Cornell, I don't think, is training new farmers. I mean, um, the academic setting that it provides is, is it provides ac uh, agricultural education, um, but it's the, the degree programs, at least, are not intended for new farmer training. And I'm, I'm, I might be totally wrong. But the other area I do see that is missing in, in sort of related to that is the uh, direct connection from, and, and maybe I'm overspoken and, and not right on this again, but um, mentor, the, the mentor farmers this, uh, that are out there right now doing this work and the students that actually want to hear from them. I feel like that is a gap that's there um, where we have professors often teaching alt forms of the agricultural knowledge that these people that are actually producing it really could provide a lot of really useful insight and I think that that bridge could really be strengthened um, for students and, and as well as community members I guess and in hearing from the small producers that are out there um, learning from them. So that would be the just two areas. I, I guess the first one was just sort of a question is like is that, is that Cornell's job is to train new farmers or is it the agricultural education for something else. Um, so, yeah. Well, I used to also work at Cornell. <laughs> and I noticed, I also graduated from Cornell. And I graduated in 2004, and I feel like uh, Cornell has gotten a lot better in its sustainable ag offerings since then. Um, but I think the gap is still applied classes. I agree with you. I think Cornell is training. Opportunities definitely still exist, but I don't think there is as much of an emphasis on them. Um, and then the skill level of students has changed, where like there's not as many students coming in with those skills, so the risk factor is actually a lot higher for teaching those things. So that was something that um, I dealt with a lot as the organic farm coordinator and the staff member in charge of the student farm. Um, and I think that that's a place that I kept hoping would just continue to get better and better agriculture wouldn't be continued to be dropped from department names and stuff like that. Well, there's one, one it's, it's almost an aside. Um, I mean, mostly I'm ignorant about most of what was just explained. Um, so one, one question would just be, um, to what degree is all of that amazing work? programming and resources, uh, to what degree are young folks aware of it? And obviously online, it's like, got it, but it's, again, it's almost that awareness thing that says, do you realize that? Here's this you know, plethora of, of information and ideas and support services, et cetera, that might not even occur to someone at an early age. Um, but it's amazing. Um, the, one, the one aside is we're, we're, try we're struggling with the youth farm um, like everyone else. Um, economically, and one of the ways that we're hoping to do something about that is to think systemically and, and think what, what kind of win-win possibilities are there for advancing local food and teaching additional skills and making some dollars that would allow us to continue this endeavor. And of course, the idea of value-added food comes up um, in varieties of ways to most people, and um, it may be that I'm just lacking sort of that, that gene that allows this to happen, but it's been difficult for me to, to sort of develop, figure out a path where, for instance, a group of high school youth could, could um, design, test, and market um, something that would allow them to learn about the economic components of this whole thing that isn't really farming, it's, it's a different aspect, but it's taking the stuff you grow and somehow having it, be, having it come back as a, as a monetary support for the endeavor. And I know that, that there are programs for that and that um, um, cooperative extension is involved, but it's been a little abusive to me. Am I allowed to just yeah. say something? I just wanted to respond to some of the comments. 
I definitely agree we need to have a lot more agriculture in the classroom. We need to bring the classroom out to where agriculture is happening. I think that's something that we started to do, as Melissa said, in the last few years at Cornell. We're offering much more experiential learning courses. I actually co-teach a class called Exploring Small Farm Dream. Um, but um, at the same time, we really do need to bring the focus much younger and work with youth ages 10 to 18. We do have a learning component in our Beginning Farm and Rancher grant where we do work with agriculture educators, but um, what we're finding is that agriculture educators are not necessarily teaching students um, to go into farming. They're teaching them to go into industry and other areas of agriculture. Um, so we really need to start with that group and start inspiring them. And we do need to extend our reaches to um, reach folks like you that are ins already inspiring students so that we can forge um, more collaborations. Can I answer a question? I just wondered if, if they're leaving, if maybe the, the agreement is to leave those aspects to the ag tech, the state ag tech schools. I don't know why that would be, but you know, that's, I think that's still happening at the, um, at the ag tech colleges, the more hands-on stuff. I don't, you know, maybe that, I don't know, is there some kind of agreement that, that Cornell serves a, d a different niche, you know? There are agriculture colleges, specifically in New York. Um, SUNY Morrisville is yeah, one of them. Yeah, that's what I mean. There's several um, New York State. Agriculture. But I don't, I don't really see the need to to leave agriculture to sort of one type of university or another. I think it needs to be happening everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering if that's it. Yeah. Specialization. It seems like that's kind of how we got here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing I was thinking about during a discussion about it. I, know, but like to what degree perhaps is Cornell developing varieties of plants that are you know, becoming you know, more suitable for this kind of climate and for the kind of climate change that this area will be um, experiencing in the future. You know, how you know, Cornell has such such powerful breeding programs, so I wonder if, if they could be really helping to secure the resilience of, of agriculture, which is really threatened by the specter of climate change. I don't know. Okay, for our last question, um, I'm wondering what changes in agriculture policy, either at the local or national level, could or should be made to help support this burgeoning agriculture renaissance that um, the film is kind of touching on? I'll jump in with just one thought. Um, somehow, um, I ran into a, accounts of a, a town in Brazil that um, larger than a town, it's five million people, and um, <laughs> they, were, they were revisiting, I guess, their, their charter, and it said something about providing healthy food for all those residents uh, that were within the defined city limit, and um, I think the place is, it's, it's called Belos, Belo Horizonte, and I found a couple of documentaries on it, um, wherein, you know, again, media is strong stuff, and who knows what, and, you know, I wasn't there, what went on, but, but the impression was that with 0.6% of the annual budget over a number of about four or five years, um, they basically pulled it off. And Ithaca has a new mayor. Um, a, a university is, is a, a, a very multifaceted resource uh, to a new mayor. And it would be interesting to, to present some thought like that that said, you know, given, given the fact that we have homeless and hunger and um, that our schools are serving foods that could be far more nutritious. Um, it, it would be interesting to just think way outside of the box and see what, what, how could Cornell help put that on the table and, and make something truly extraordinary happen as a model. As somebody who works at Cornell, I want to encourage all of you who are townies to pull, drag, whatever it takes to get us into this because sometimes that's where new ideas come from. And I think we're, one of the things I'm trying to do in my job is to get this be more of a dialogue. Mm -hmm. And so I think people in the community should look at Cornell doing things for them. It's like, challenge us, got us engaged. We have a sort of collaborated idea. I know all of us back this idea, but um, a friend of ours actually was a friend of ours and who is um, a coordinator with the youth farm um, wasn't isn't here, but she got the questions and thought about them and um, gave us an answer for this.
question that she thought was appropriate, and it's pretty simple, and I know that um, I agree. So it's just about um, having freshmen at Cornell um, have a mandatory amount of community service hours on local farms. Um, so it's a pretty basic but <coughs> powerful thing. Um, and also having a percentage of the um, food supplied here, cafeteria food. largely keeping us uh, stuck in a rut is that uh, of the 
artificially low price of, of energy in general. I think it's uh, it's sort of warping our view on on what it takes to do the alchemy of farming of to to produce food and to how much it should cost and um, what are the best ways to go about it and get it to other people. Just the fact that um, that that the, the source of that production is um, the, the the cost of it is kept so artificially low that it's uh, it's created a big misperception. It's a big hurdle for for people who are um, who have different you know who have different value sets beyond beyond the dollar is uh, hard to hard to promote a lot of these more regenerative practices. farmers being good advocates for themselves and for the movement and um, like there are a lot of really progressive programs out there in the um, government agencies already they have to be utilized and people have to try hard to get them utilized because I think the most progressive ones the NRCS for example has these windbreak programs they have alley cropping programs they have cover cropping programs that are underutilized greatly to some of the like erosion control, which is like fixing bad behavior, moving, helping the NRCS, which seems to me wanting to move itself towards rewarding good behavior. Uh, that's where, you know, like I think that's a thing that is in our hands. The programs actually exist already, but they have to be utilized in order for them to stay put and available. I'm curious what it is that those of us who want to build a
is the substitution of organically certified inputs. <laughs> That's not what organic farming is, and I think that you need a whole different set of trainees to evaluate nutrient pest management plans than you do in a conventional setting. Melissa, can you talk about permaculture a little bit and how that influences the way you guys are going? I mean, is that training available through Cornell? Um, it, I feel like it's creeping in there. We we were invited. We've been invited to speak at several classes at Cornell. And I think, um, in particular, Lori Drinkwater's pro programs do a really good job. She teaches a class called the Ecology of Agriculture. People in here from There's a reading in. group next semester: C. Gabriel and Jane Tom Pleasant in permaculture. Yeah. So if anyone's interested in that, you can look it up. I think. Um, I think that what Garrett was saying earlier about it being hard to farm by. I don't remember how to sort of bring it all together, but if you're farming by values and you're constantly challenged by dollars, like to bring those things together is very challenging. And permaculture, uh, in my experience of it, which I feel like is fairly broad, um, hasn't proven itself super well as a way to farm in a financially sustainable way. And that's actually one of the goals of our farm is to use these lenses of values and in our case, there's, we tried to narrow it down to a couple, and one of them is energy descent, so using less energy, fossil energy, on our farm every year. Um, we try to make decisions through that lens, but we're also we actually have a farm plan, and you know we're actually you know trying to run a profit loss business like that makes sense. So um, I don't know if I answered your question, but I think that permaculture doesn't need to be taught as permaculture for people to think that way. There's an enormous a lot of them are available in front of Systems thinking might be a more appropriate term. Thank you all so much. Let's give a hand to